the pace that we're all on these days can seem frenetic, even on the best days. From a perpetually clogged inbox that can dictate our every action to calendars that are filled with so many meetings that we have scant time to do any actual work, the rigors of work life take a toll. Khalil Gibran perfectly intones why our busyness and loquaciousness may be a blockade to reflection in his classic work, The Prophet. You talk when you cease to be at peace with your thoughts. And when you can no longer dwell in the solitude of your heart, you live in your lips and sound is a diversion and a pastime. And in much of your talking, your thinking is half murdered. For a thought is a bird of space that in a case of words may indeed unfold its wings, but cannot fly. There are those among you who seek the talkative through fear of being alone. The silence of aloneness reveals to their eyes their naked selves and they would escape. There are those who talk and without knowledge or forethought reveal a truth which they themselves do not understand. And there are those who have the truth within them, but they tell it not in words. We seem to be always running to one thing or another, and in some cases, running from ourselves. As leaders, we're expected to give feedback to our team constantly. Feedback is what helps people become aware of their behaviors and how those behaviors are affecting others around them. Of course, what they choose to do with that feedback is up to them. But when you're always busy managing others, trying to run your team, trying to keep up with the latest developments in your company and in your industry, it can be hard to find the time you need for you. Taking the time for yourself first, whether you're a freelancer or managing a whole team of people, is essential. Because when you know yourself you're better positioned to help others. And isn't that what leadership is all about? Have you ever admired a leader and wondered just what it is that makes her who she is? How he came to embrace the things that advanced him? Welcome to Timeless Leadership, where we look at the principles that defines success. This is a show for leaders at all stages of their careers who aspire to understand what it truly means to be a leader. And who is a leader? Dolly Parton said, If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. Together, we'll explore key principles not only in the sense of fundamentals, but also in the ethical sense, the habits, character traits, and virtues that form the backbone of leadership, principles that are just as relevant and essential in the 21st century as they were in the first century. This is Timeless Leadership. Hi there, welcome to Timeless Leadership, the podcast where we explore principles and virtues that accompany successful and admirable leaders. I'm your host, Scott Monty. Uh, feel free to listen to and follow this show wherever you get your podcasts. We release new shows, new episodes every other week. And on the opposite week, I've started something different. It's called Story Time. It's a five-minute show featuring familiar names and events from history, but told from a much different perspective. It's an exercise in storytelling, which, as you know, is an essential skill for every leader. You can get Story Time by subscribing to the Timeless and Timely newsletter. It's in the feed there and distributed as a podcast. And I hope you do subscribe to the newsletter to get regular information on leadership and communications. And of course, if you can use any help with storytelling, with leadership, please feel free to reach out. You can find me at timeless at scottmonte.com on email. 
and of course all over the web as well. Today, we're talking with former Yum! Brands CEO David Novak, who's an author and a philanthropist as well, on the importance and art of self-coaching. David Novak is co-founder and CEO of How Leaders Lead, a digital leadership development platform he created to help people become better leaders by teaching vital, heart-wiring, and hard-wiring skills. He's co-founder and retired chairman and CEO of Yum! Brands, one of the world's largest restaurant companies with over 45,000 restaurants in more than 135 countries and territories. He retired in 2016. David's passion is to make the world a better place by developing leaders at all ages through How Leaders Lead, his family's Lift a Life Foundation, Lead for Change, Global Game Changers, and the Novak Leadership Institute at the University of Missouri. A renowned expert on leadership and recognition culture, Novak is also a best-selling leadership book author. His highly respected and critically acclaimed books include the New York Times bestseller, Taking People With You, The Only Way to Achieve Big Things, The Education of an Accidental CEO, Lessons Learned from the Trailer Park to the Corner Office, and the parable, Oh Great One, A Little Story About the Awesome Power of Recognition. In his latest book, David teams up with Jason Goldsmith, globally recognized sports performance coach to some of the world's best athletes, to bring you a groundbreaking new concept in leadership development, self-coaching. It's called Take Charge of You, How Self-Coaching Can Transform Your Life and Career. David, welcome to Timeless Leadership. Thank you very much, Scott. I appreciate you having me on the show. Well, I've really been looking forward to this. I mean, I've been following you for, wow, forever. I mean, it seems like since the time I was at Ford, you were ranked, uh, you know, as one of the top Fortune 500 CEOs uh, back in, I think, 2012. Um, it's just an honor to, to have you on the show. Well, thanks, Scott. I, I appreciate it. And I, I follow you on Twitter as well, and I really admire what you're doing on the leadership front. So, it's, it's, it's great to be with you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, we're here to talk about your, your new book, Take Charge of You, How Self-Coaching Can Transform Your Life and Career. I'm interested to know, David, who's the first coach in your life that you remember? Well, I'd have to say it was my mother. Uh, you know, I think my dad was the standard bearer, uh, but my mother was my coach and she was, she always gave me the the sense that I could accomplish anything in the world, and she was always had my back. And uh, you know, she just uh, to this day, Scott, if I go on CNBC on Squawk Box or whatever, she'll be the first to call me uh, after it's over and say, "Hey, David, you did a great job." It, you know, she's she's ninety two years old and uh, still still my biggest fan. But you know, I think coaches. Uh, really have to believe in you. And then they got to spend the time to, to equip you with what you need to, to, to go to the new heights. And my mom certainly did that for me. Uh, that, that is absolutely amazing. And the fact that she's still uh, with it and still cheering you on. I mean, I think that's fantastic. And, you know, not everyone has an opportunity to have a parent that is so utterly behind them. Uh, you know, people come from all kinds of backgrounds. And you yourself uh, write about your own background where uh, you were very, very migratory for uh, <laughs> the, the first decade or so of your life. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I lived in 23 states by the time I was in seventh grade. My, my dad was a government surveyor. So he mapped uh, longitude and latitude points. Uh, which basically formed the foundation for today's GPS. He didn't know it at the time, obviously. Uh, but we, he was in a surveying party. So we were part of t basically 15 to 20 families. And every three months, they'd hook the government trucks up to the, the trailer and we'd move to our next trailer park and go to our next spot. I, I'm the only guy, Scott, that you probably know that ever lived in Dodge City, Kansas. But I think what really makes me unique is I lived in Dodge City, Kansas twice. Uh, but I lived in small town America from 
you know, uh, Detroit Lakes, uh, Minnesota to Premont, Texas to, you know, uh, Tucumcari, uh, New Mexico. I never lived on the East Coast or the West Coast, but basically in the heartland, going from small town to small town with my dad's surveying party. That's amazing. And I, I'm sure you can learn uh, a lot from uh, people, you know, in the heartland of America. I mean, these are people that are, um, you know, that have the struggles, uh, maybe more so than some on the coasts. And you really get to see what people are made of. And I will note, uh, David, that you're probably the only guy who got out of Dodge twice. (laughs) (laughs) That's Um, probably true. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So when you think about, uh, you know, people who are struggling, and we all have struggles in our personal lives, in our careers, we run up against um, whether it's blockades or uh, mental blocks, uh, if you will, how how do you think coaching can help people kind of overcome those blockades? Well, I think one of the reasons why we wrote the book, Take Charge of You, Scott, was is that, you know, people are basically starved for coaching. Uh, they're not getting it at work. Uh, well over half the population or working population feels like they should get better coaching at work. And, you know, it's it's a big problem today. You know, I think toxic leadership is is a huge problem today, and it's reason why I'm focused on trying to make the world a better place by developing better leaders like you. And 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 I think coaching is 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 in in high demand. And one of the reasons why uh, coaching uh, is is so important is that you know you've got to have high self awareness. So that you can, can, can really grow a, as a leader. And, and that's why, you know, we decided to take a different angle with our book and, and really focus on self coaching, you know, taking accountability for coaching yourself. Because if people aren't getting it at work, they got to get it somewhere else. Okay. Um, but once you, once you have higher self awareness, you're able to understand what those roadblocks blocks are that you were referring to and develop an action plan to figure out how to how to take yourself to a new place. And coaches can help you do that, but I think you you have to take accountability for it yourself. I bet if you look back at your career, there are many times where you coached yourself on on making the right move. You might have gotten information from other people, but in the end, you had to kind of Really look at yourself and say, "Hey, it's time for me to do this or or that." And so, what we've tried to do is really give people a process to help them do that. Yeah, and I I love the formula of the book. We'll we'll, we'll get to um you know some of those those chapters and and the toolkit yeah. that you leave with people because I think that is probably the most useful part of the book. Um, and uh, you know this this notion of self awareness and self knowledge. I, I mean, this is the you know, the cornerstone of, uh, of EQ, of emotional mm-hmm. intelligence. And I think mm-hmm. every good leader exhibits some sort of emotional intelligence. And particularly now, you know, when you say people are coach, uh, are starved for coaching, when so many people are doing remote work, when teams are divided, you know, across the country, and not co-located in the same office anymore. And and I don't know, quite frankly, if we're ever going to go back to that old way of doing things. Um, there, there has to be some sort of, of self-awareness and, and the willingness to take charge of you, uh, just as the book says, to, to jumpstart yourself in this direction. Because you, you might not, you, you certainly won't get it from a toxic boss, a manager, uh, but you might not get it in terms of, uh, the traditional type of coaching that some companies, some companies um, offered. Right. Yeah. And, and I think uh, you're right. And with what's happened with the pandemic and uh, the virtual working, I think the fact that the need to self-coach is, has never been greater. You know, we started writing this book before the before the pandemic, but I don't think it could be better timed. No. Because you've got the great resignation, you've got all these people that are basically looking at themselves. People have had more time for self-reflection than ever before, and they're making moves. But, you know, you just can't move for moving sake, as you well know, Scott. You need to move with purpose, and you need to move to something that's truly going to be better. 
And, you know, I think that's why it does require self-awareness, self-examination and, and a real understanding of what it's going to take to, to, to help you get the joy you want in your life. Yeah. Yeah. And and you said a, a key word there, purpose. Um, and, and it was a, a phrase that you used in the book that really jumped out at me. You said because because the other P word that we hear a lot about uh, in terms of people finding their way is passion. And you said passion can be fleeting, but purpose keeps you focused. What do you mean by that? Well, if you think about it, you can be passionate about a lot of things. Okay. I mean, just think of coming up before you were married or whatever. You, you probably dated a lot of girls, but you know, you might be passionate about a lot of them, but you, you didn't, it didn't end up being the thing that would really keep you motivated for the, for the long term. Okay. And, you know, but purpose gets you focused. Once you have purpose, okay. Uh, you know, that keeps you on point. Uh, passion comes and goes. Okay. But purpose keeps you on point. And once you can really, you know, figure out what that purpose is that you have in your life and, and you can gear your life around that, I think that's the, the key towards really having, uh, a sustainable, happy life. Yeah, absolutely on that one. And, and I think that's the thing that a lot of people are searching for and, and they're struggling in some ways. And I think the, the steps that you've outlined here help us get to uh, defining what that purpose is. Now, in, in terms of your own career, David, can you walk us through how you eventually found your purpose? I mean, you had a very, uh, successful run at, uh, PepsiCo and uh, eventually it's uh, it's right. spinoff. Can you talk a little bit about that journey and how you came to find your purpose in that? Yeah. Well, I think first of all, I started out with passion. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I got my passion when I fell in love with advertising and marketing. You know, it was something that I just really loved. And when you fall in love with something, you know, you, you can't get enough of it. Okay. And so, you know, it made me, you know, want to learn. And very rarely are you passionate about something unless you like it. So, you know, people always say, Hey, do what you love. Well, why? Okay. Because you're usually pretty good at what you love and, and you want to learn more about what you love. And as a result, your skill level just gets better and better and better. But as I was coming up in, in business, I did it from the marketing and advertising route. And, you know, I was passionate about all that. But what, what really gave me my purpose? is when I started managing and started leading people and started getting the joy of helping other people achieve their potential and do things that they would have never done without my help or without my coaching. And uh, so my purpose became, became uh, very early on to make the world a better place by developing better leaders. Um, and, you know, when I was at Young Brands, uh, one of the most impactful things I did is I, I taught a, a two and a half to three day, uh, leadership seminar that I taught every module in it. Uh, and it was on the process of taking people with you, the only way to make big things happen. And I later wrote a book on that, uh, so I could cascade that, the, that, the, 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 the program out to all of our restaurant managers. But, but, you know, to me, when I, when I would teach that program, Scott, at the end of the two and a half days, I was absolutely wiped out. There was nothing that, 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 you know, drained me more, but there was nothing that gave me more joy, more satisfaction, nor uh, more fulfillment. And so when I, I decided to move into my next chapter after Young Brands, I looked back at my, my career and said, where did I get the most uh, joy? And it was from uh, teaching leadership. And that's how I'm spending my time now. I've, I've got my David Novak leadership. My family foundation is focused on developing leaders at all levels, uh, from elementary school, middle school, high school, college, aspiring leaders. And, uh, and you know, I, I do my po podcast myself on how leaders lead. So all geared uh, around, you know, making the world a better place by helping people become better leaders. And when you think about it, Scott, one of the most sad uh, facts that I, I've seen from Gallup is that 82% of people go to work and they don't feel engaged. And why is that? It's because there isn't the leadership that we need to get people, uh, uh, you know, pumped up and excited and feel valued for what they do. I completely agree, David. And that, that's part of the reason that I, I'm doing this. I think there's so many stories of great leaders and people to inspire us and that we can learn from. 
Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a lifelong learner. You know, I, I went to, to college and I got a few degrees, but uh, it didn't stop once I, once I left the halls of uh, the academy. Um, and, and what's really interesting to me is I hear you talking about uh, this wonderful passion you have for engaging with people, for helping people succeed. And I've seen um, pictures and video that you have shared online of your home office. You want to tell our listeners <laughs> the story of your home office and uh, why it connects to taking people with you? Well, when I was uh, running Young Brands and actually when I was started out being the president of KFC, one of the things I wanted to do is uh, was to make the differentiating behavior in our company recognition. I wanted our company to, to be renowned for, for recognizing the achievement of others. So you know, I had my own personal recognition awards. And like when I was the president of KFC, I gave away a rubber chicken. When I was president of Pizza Hut, I gave away a, a, a Green Bay Packers cheese head. And then when I was president, it was CEO of Young Brands, I gave away these walk the talk teeth. But what I do is I go in and I find, you know, anytime I saw someone doing something great, uh, and I would, I would recognize them with one of these awards. And then I'd take a picture of them. And, and I'd say, look, I'm going to send you a frame picture of us together and you can do whatever you can watch. You could toss it in the trash or, and then I'm also going to get the frame picture, but I'm going to put your picture in my office and hang it in my office because, uh, what you do is what really makes our business tick. And so I started hanging all the people that I, uh, pictures of all the people that I recognized uh, around the world, my office, people said, well, what's going to happen when you run out of wall space, which happened? I said, well, I'm going to put pictures on the ceiling. And so I actually have pictures on the ceiling in my office and, uh, it go, the, the pictures go out in the hallways, you know, uh, and, you know, but people want to see the CEO's office. They want to see, uh, the office is just one of the things and then any, uh, headquarters, we call it ours, our restaurant support center. So when people come in, they would come walk into my office and it would show what our business is all about as people. You know, I say the formula for success is get your people capability, right? Then you satisfy customers, then you make money. You know, too many people start thinking about, Hey, I want to make money, but they don't know how to get there. But I wanted people to know that people were recognized at our company, valued, and appreciated in our company. And my office was symbolic of, of that. And the other thing that it did for me, Scott, there was never a time where I walked into my office where it didn't get me into a better mood, you know, because I always felt privileged to be the leader, the privilege to be able to, to, to recognize people who are really making it happen. And I think every leader needs to develop a, a, a culture where everyone counts, where people know that they're valued and appreciated. And recognition is really your secret weapon as a leader and two, two, two people don't exercise that, that opportunity. Yeah. I, I love that. Uh, back in the first season, we talked with Marilyn just about leader humility and she co-authored a book with Alan Mulally, my old boss. Mm -hmm. And, um, she said the way they defined humility was, um, recognizing the, uh, or respecting the dignity of every person you come into contact with. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what you're talking about there, the recognition, acknowledging people. And quite frankly, uh, you know, booing your mood is probably easy because every single one of those pictures comes with a story, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a story, story that behind you, everyone. You, yeah, you, you replay it in your head. You can tell it to other people when they come in and they say, what's this all about? I mean, it's just a wonderful, wonderful mechanism for remembering why you're there in the first place. You know, building on, Allen's and, and Marilyn's uh, definition of, of humility, I think it even goes a step further uh, than than giving people their dignity. I, I think it, it says that you can't do it by yourself, you know, and, and that humility really says you need other people. You know, it's one thing to give people dignity because you happen to have more power than somebody else or, or you know, you're at a higher level. It's another to say, hey, look, I, I really can't uh, get done what needs to get done without what you do. And I, you know, I always felt like the number one leader in our company was not the CEO, not me. It was always our restaurant general managers because they built the teams that satisfied the customers. And, and, you know, but, you know, 
it's important for leaders to let others know that they need them and you can't do it by yourself. Yeah. So that leads me to the natural progression, the natural question. When we're talking about take charge of you, self-coaching, that seems like it's a very isolated approach. But the way you describe it in the book, it actually isn't. So can you describe how it's consistent yeah. with what we just talked about in terms of collaboration and yeah. including other people? Yeah, self-coaching means that you basically take accountability for your, for your coaching. And it, and it's, and it really starts with, you know, getting, asking yourself some really good questions and, and building your self awareness. Now, from that point on, then it's like you, you, you have a real understanding of what your strengths and your areas of opportunity might be. Then you can go out and get what we call our assistant coaches. Who are the people that can really help you get better at the things you need to get better at? Or, uh, just as importantly, leveraging your strengths. If you're really good at marketing, who can help you get better at marketing or who can help you get better at finance? Because, you know, you can build off of what the, the, the strengths are that are that you have. So, you know, I think self-coaching doesn't mean that you do it uh, by yourself. It means that you focus in on the learning that's going to help you uh, the most. For example, when I was uh, became CEO of Young Brands, I'd never really worked with the investment community. And so I thought, who could really help me understand how to talk to shareholders? Now that, well, Warren Buffett might be a really good start. And so, you know, I used some contacts and I got in to see Warren Buffett, I think in 1999. And I saw him all the way up through 2016, once a, once a, once a year, every fall in Omaha, Nebraska. And he gave me great insights on, on how I could uh, manage the investment community. And uh, he taught me the importance of, of talking about the things that could go wrong as well as the things that could go right. Uh, because he said that would make you, make you more trusted. And the sooner you would, you talk about the things that could potentially hurt your business, uh, at least uh, for the short term, the more people are going to believe you, believe in you as a leader, have, know that you're grounded in, 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 in the real business and, you know, uh, believe that, uh, there's some real upside in the company as well. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it sounds like he gave you a lot of good insights to just, you know, running a business in general, but it probably gave you some insights into your own abilities and your own approach to things too. Yeah, I, I think so. I think what he did was he gave me a lot of confidence. Okay. You know, because we hit it off and it, you know, uh, I think when you get a, get someone like a Warren Buffett believing in you and saying nice things about you, it, it makes you feel good. Okay. I, I got to tell you, I mean, just the fact that he would let me back in his office the second year made me feel good, you know, <laughs> and I, I, I feel very, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's fun to talk about the fact that I got to spend so much time with him. And when I met with him, I not only went, by myself, I took our top performers. It was sort of like a little bit of recognition for, for them as well. I took somebody from Australia once, and he actually had an Australian flag uh, hanging outside of his office. He's a great guy. You know, talk about humble. He's about as humble as they get. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. So, um, you know, th this idea of uh, cobbling together your team of assistant coaches, you know, you've got people and all different aspects of uh, business, all, all different aspects of life that can give you advice. Um, it, and, and what you just said about Warren Buffett, uh, believing in you, it, it reminds me, and you know, I'm, I'm coming way up to the present moment now. It reminds me of what I've seen over the last couple of seasons of Ted Lasso. I don't know if you've had a chance to watch that program. Uh, Absolutely, David. But yeah. the the whole thing there is is believe. That's that's right over Ted's door. It says believe. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what belief means in context yeah. of coaching? Well, I, I think uh, first of all, you, I really believe, no pun intended, that you 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 become what you think you are. Okay, so. You know, you've got to build your, if, if somebody else isn't building your confidence, you've got to find a way to build your confidence. You know, we talk about the importance of building your own personal highlight reel. Okay. You know, you know, thinking back on your career and your life, those moments when you actually succeeded, you know, 
but believing is is really a, a key component of, of leadership. You know, you have to inspire others to, to believe in the possibilities of, of the business. And, you know, I think it was uh, Napoleon who said the first responsibility of leadership is to define reality and and create hope. OK, so, you know, I think in coaching, when you're coaching yourself, you got to define the reality for yourself, you know, in terms of this is you know, who you are today. And then you create hope by, by saying, okay, this is where, uh, what I need to do to take me to where I want to go tomorrow and I can do it. Okay. I love that Ted Lasso, uh, uh, story. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great example of, of what happens with just that, that one word that just, uh, belief. And then as a leader, uh, sharing it with your people. And one of the other things that's interesting about Ted Lasso is, is one of the guys that he believed in is that uh, uh, his assistant coach. Nate. Okay. He, yeah, and took Nate and gave him all this opportunity, and then Nate dumps him and leaves him, okay? But I think that's part of leadership, too. You know, you can do good, and people will let you down. Do good anyway, okay? That's just the way how it works. That's, that's a great point. So, so what, what happens when you're, when you're self coaching and, and you believe in yourself or you're, you're, you're uh, trying to get yourself back up to an upright position after you've had a defeat? You play your personal highlight reel for yourself. Um, talk, talk a little bit about, uh, listening to yourself, those voices in your head and, you know, how you're framing everything. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, when you do have a, a, a roadblock or, or you got to get started again, it's so important to get started with purpose. OK, and that's where I think you really got to ask yourself, what takes away your joy in life? OK, you know, what are your joy blockers? OK, you write them down, think about it, write them down and then say to yourself, OK, what are your joy builders? OK, what really gives you joy? OK. And, and then, then I think that really helps you decide, okay, this is what gives me joy. This is what takes the joy away. How am I spending my time? What am I doing today? And if you find that you're spending a lot of your time in the area that is blocking your joy, that's when you really got to reevaluate yourself. Now, everybody talks about the great resignation now and all this. Well, it's one thing to go from one job to another, but how are you going to go to a job that's going to be more fulfilling to you than, than for you. I think you better understand what truly gives you joy, you know, and, and that's, that's, that's really key because from that you can develop the single biggest thing that'll have the biggest impact on your career. The SBT, as you call it in the book. Right. Right. I right. love that. And that's, that's something that becomes some, uh, somewhat of a, a North star at that point. That yeah, abs- absolutely. You may get kicked absolutely. off course from time to time, but if that's what you're orienting yourself toward, then you keep working toward it. Yeah, because you now have a purpose because you've identified what your joys are, you know, how you want to spend your time. A good example in, in my career, Scott, was when I was uh, president of KFC, I got the opportunity at PepsiCo. We had a number of divisions. We had PepsiCola. We had the restaurants, uh, which KFC, Pizza Hut, and Taco Bell, and we had Frito-Lay. But I got the opportunity to go, go be the CEO of, of Frito-Lay, and I turned it down. Okay, now this was a much bigger job. Okay, in in PepsiCo, but why did I turn it down? Because I looked at what really gives me joy, and, and what I I love more than anything was I, I I love the restaurant business. Okay, I love the people in the restaurant business. I love the fact that it was people. I love the fact that it was all about food. I love eating food. I like going in the test kitchen, creating recipes, and I love marketing. There's nothing, no category that's more uh, responsive to marketing than, than the food service business. And those were the things that really made me tick. And so I told, you know, Roger Enrico, who's the chairman at that time, I said, I want to stay in the restaurant business. This is what I love. And Little did I know that during that time, PepsiCo was in the process of thinking through spinning off the restaurants. Since by saying no to Frito-Lay, I ended up running KFC and Pizza Hut, and I was at the right place in the right time. But it was because I, I, I followed my joy. Well, and you had a few moments like that with Roger where you seemingly turned him down for things or, or battled for uh, what you thought was the more appropriate placement. Um, it it, it must've been terrifying to basically put everything on the line because he could have turned the other way and said, well, that's it, pal, you're out. 
Yeah. yeah. I never really thought about that. Uh, you know, certainly when I turned down free to lay, I did think about it another time when, when he wanted me to work for somebody, when we were going to be spun off, uh, that I didn't think I should work for. And I, I basically said I wasn't going to do it. And the, the HR person told me I was going to get fired. And, you know, I realized at that point that there's only one person that wins, Scott, and that's the boss. And so I called up Roger and said, hey, look, let me tell you, I want to come talk to you and tell you why, why I, I, I don't want to work for this person and what I would do if I had the opportunity to run the restaurants. And I, I, I went to his office and I, took him through a presentation and uh, ultimately got the job. But, but yeah, you, you know, it was kind of uh, terrifying. It, it's not something I told, I, I never told my wife that I did it. I think she might've been a little upset with me. <laughs> Holy cow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Then you would have needed to find a purpose. Um, right. No yeah, question. Absolutely. Um, but you must've had a, a, a certain kind of relationship with him that allowed you to feel like he, he trusted you to, to come at him with, with that, to, to have a little give and take. I, I don't think it sounds like it was this kind of draconian type of, of uh, relationship. No, I think Roger really wanted me to, to be successful. Roger was a good coach for me. I'd learned a lot from Roger over the years. Uh, he, he's a brilliant guy. He knew I respected him uh, a lot. He just didn't think that I had the financial experience to, to run the uh, young brands when we were first spun off. And he, he was right. OK, but I didn't think the guy that he originally wanted me to work for had any more than me. And that's where we we differed. OK, but I was able to call him up and leverage the relationship that I had and and get that hearing with him and make my case in the calm light of day. And he listened. And we, we came up with a win win in the end. Okay. So how did so you you're end up, absolutely right? Yeah. So so how did you end up getting the financial coaching that you needed for that particular uh, position? Well, um, you know, I I run businesses, so I you know I could do the P and L, but I never worked with Wall Street, and that's what uh, 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 Roger was really looking for. So we needed to have a chairman in the company. Okay, and you know. Uh, I made a couple of recommendations early on. One was Don Kendall, okay, who was the chairman of PepsiCo, who loved the restaurant business. And the other was Andy Pearson, who had been the president of PepsiCo uh, and was a teacher at Harvard Business School. And ultimately, uh, Andy became the, the chairman of the company. And, you know, he, he, uh, he gave me the coaching and, 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 and opened up the door to other people, helped create a fantastic board of directors for us that, that helped us get, get started and helped me learn the ropes on the financial, uh, financial side. So Andy was a, a great mentor of mine. So when, when you've got your, your assistant coaches, when you're getting, insights from all these people i mean you're you've got you may have some competing uh bits of advice that are coming in so how do you manage to you know kind of take all of that swirling advice and insights and actually make it your own as part of a, a yeah. self-coaching journey yeah well you know i think that you have to be a fact finder okay you got to gather facts you have to build your know-how. And then in the end, you have to step back and you have to make a decision based on all of that. Okay. And I think that's where self-coaching does come into play, you know, because you're going to have a lot of people come at you, like you say, with different points of view. But you've got to decide what you think is right in, in the end. And that's where I think the self-reflection comes into play. That's where the analysis of the situation comes into play. And that's when you got to step up and basically make the, make the decision. Because, you know, too many leaders get paralyzed in situations like that. You got everybody throwing all these different thoughts at you. But, hey, there, people are still waiting for you to sit down at the piano and play. Okay. And in the end, you got to, you got to pull the trigger and, and make that call. And if you don't make it, after you've gone through the rigor of getting the, the, the facts that you, you you need to look at, then the organization is, is is paralyzed and they're looking for somebody to make that decision. And that's how I think people lose their jobs in the end. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. It comes down to execution. And and for that purpose, we get to the, the point in the, the book where you talk about the journey, which is really about turning those insights into action 
and and having a roadmap for where you want to go and and knowing whether you're on track or not, whether you're on course. Yeah, um, you know, it's so so important. You you, you got to have an action plan, okay? And like everything, you you know, you got to track it. If it's important enough, you got to measure it. You know, I, I I know I know what you did at Ford and and how you helped turn that business around. I you you measured the key things that were really going to make that business tick. And you know, once you started making improvement in those areas, you know, the business started to to take off and and you actually turned it around. And you as a leader, it's no different. Uh, you know, you gotta you gotta understand. What is the insight that's going to take you forward? And then how do you develop a, an action plan around it? And then how do you measure, measure your progress so that you're, you're, you're truly successful? I think that is so important, David. I mean, we were always told uh, at Ford, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And we tend to think of some of these leadership skills, these quote unquote soft skills, which are not soft at all. They are, they are hard. Um, we, we don't really think about how we track our progress. And I think your, your notion of creating a roadmap and measuring against that plan, uh, makes a great deal of sense, uh, in a way that I really haven't seen it stated before. You know, one of the things, uh, Scott, that I, I use as a coaching tool with all my executives is what I call my three by five card exercise, where basically I had every leader and I did this myself. Um, I'd write down, what am I today? And then I'd write down, what do I need to be tomorrow to be more effective? And I would send that out to all of uh, our top 100 leaders and say, okay, this is what I'm working on. Help me. When you see me doing this stuff, help me reinforce what I need to keep reinforcing and help me change what I need to change and get better at. And then I had everybody on the team do their three by five card as well. And then when I had my one-on-one coaching sessions every month with these leaders, um, or every quarter, depending on the level, uh, you know, I would say, let's get out your three by five card. You know, tell me how you're doing. And, you know, we would track our uh, progress on on the things that people thought was important. But, you know, I think you do need a personal roadmap that'll take you, uh, you know, that take you where you want to go. In fact, I, I have my three by five card on my, I keep it on my refrigerator. Uh, you know, I look at it every day. And so it kind of keeps it uh, front and center for me. I love that. I mean, it not only is it a, a wonderful um, shortcut that people understand what you mean immediately when you say, well, what's on your three by five card? Right. Uh, it's it's literally something you can look at every single day. Absolutely. And, you know, when you keep things uh, top of mind, the, you, you know, it's it's important. So often we get sidetracked, you know, we lose focus on, on what really matters to us or our business. So you have to have process and discipline around what really matters. You have to have find ways to make sure that what really matters to you, uh, sticks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I just thought of another, uh, quote is speaking of popular culture. Uh, there's another show I watched recently. And I, you know, I'm catching up on all the shows I missed for <laughs> three years before I'm binging now. Um, there's a show called The Good Life or The Good Place. Mm. Sorry, sorry, The Good Place. Ted Danson is in it. And, um, it's essentially it is, uh, about heaven and hell. And he, he is a reformed demon. And I, you know, there's all kinds of spoiler alerts I should have warned people about here. But anyway, he's a reformed demon and he, he basically comes around in the final season and says, I realize that the people I'm working with um, aren't necessarily good or bad people. They're trying to become better tomorrow than they were today. Mm. And to me, that that says so much about leadership, certainly about self-coaching. It isn't whether you're the best possible leader you can be. It's are you making incremental improvement every single day? Yeah, if you can get, you know, 1% every day, it's sort of like compounded interest. You know, you just get better and better and better and, you know, it just, it, it compounds. And, and, you know, I think the other thing too, as a coach, as a leader, you know, and, and you're, you're always wanting to give le- leaders insights out there. It's so important to think that 99.9% of the people that are in your company come to work every day wanting to do good. 
people don't come in wanting to do do poorly. Okay, That's you true. know, and and you know, so many people organize their their company around catching the one tenth of one uh, percent of people who, who 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 you know don't have their head on right. You know, and boy, that just spoils it for the rest of us. Okay, and the other thing is is that people. Don't get inspired. Nobody goes to work wanting to be a part of something mediocre. You know, people want to go to work, be a part of something great. You know, they want to be a part of making something better. So the more you can give purpose to what they do and and what you're embarking on and and let them know that you value them for what they're doing, the more they're going to the more the more engaged they're going to be and the more they're going to follow you as a leader. Uh, that is that is so spot on. I mean, we don't we don't usually break it down that way, but it, when you when you say it like that, it makes great sense. Um, so why don't why don't you take us into uh, the self coaching habit? How we can start putting some of these uh, these things that you've talked about into action? Yeah, well, I think what we're really talking about here is just having uh, constant improvement. You know, it's, 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 it's really, it's like we were talking earlier, you know, what is it that you want to do now? How do you get better at that every single day? You don't have to have the big quantum leap, but how do you just continually make incremental improvement? One way to develop the coaching habit is to go public. You know, uh, when you go public and you tell people what you're trying to do and what your goals are and, 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 and what you want to get done. Okay. It's hard to go back. It's hard to go back and have any kind of integrity because, you know, people won't believe you if you don't do what you say. OK, so I always believed in in, you know, going public uh, and saying this is what I'm trying to do. This is why I shared my three by five card. This is what I'm trying to do. OK, you know, tell me when you see me doing it. Tell me when you see uh, tell me when I'm not doing it. OK, but I need you. You know, I need you to help me to be better. Um, so I, I think once you have identified what your roadmap is, you know, how, what you really want to get better at, where you want to go, where you want to focus your life or your career, whether you want to be a homemaker or the best plumber in the world. Okay. Then it, it comes down to, okay, what are the specific steps that you have to take to get there and who can you learn from and how can you raise your game? It's having a real raise the bar mentality. Uh, on yourself. Uh, I, I think that is, uh, that's uh, one of these things that's simple yet profound at the same time. And, uh, you know, your notion of going public, you know, as you say, it creates accountability, but it creates a, a sense of community effort of everyone pulling together, people wanting to help someone out. You know, we, Absolutely. We, we saw this in the BPR every week at Ford. You know, someone would, would flag something red on their plan and all of a sudden hands would shoot up from around the table of people volunteering to help fix it. It wasn't that person's problem. It was the company's problem. And everyone kind of grappled onto it together. And I think uh, setting goals and, and coaching yourself and putting it out there, what kind of a leader you want to be. Hey, uh, kick me upside the head if I'm if if I'm really off the path here. Help help me get back on where I need to go. That's that's a great mentality. Yeah, I, I think that, that that's when the collaboration comes into play. And I remember one of the great Ford stories that either you or Alan Mulally talked about is that that first time when people when you're looking at your charts and the first time somebody showed some red on their charts because for everybody started came in with green charts. You're using, losing billions of dollars and everything's all green. And he goes, ah, how in the heck can everything be green? And we're losing a billion bucks. And then, you know, somebody comes in and actually comes in with a chart that has some red on it. And he applauds. Okay. Because he says, it's okay. It's okay to be honest. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to say you got some work to do. What, what we can't do around here is BS each other, you know? And I think that's, that's what the self coaching habit is all about. You can't BS yourself. Okay. You gotta, you gotta now put the habits in place that'll get you to where you want to go. That That's exactly right. And, and, you know, while it was okay to struggle for a little, a little bit and, and have a red on your chart for maybe a couple of weeks, if it was consistently there, well, that's a problem, right? Yeah. And you don't want to see that either. You don't want to BS people and you don't want to kind of maintain this stasis of mediocrity either. You need to have forward motion. 
Well, when that red shows up, then that's when your power, your culture shows up because everybody collaborates and says, hey, you might want to look at this. You might want to do this. You might want to do that. You know, it's it's like you say, you know, you can make a mistake once. It's OK. You can fail once. But if you make the same mistake over and again or you make, do fail in the same way over and over again, there's that's there's not a happy ending to that. Okay? Well, you're, you're right. And, and I think, you know, hearkening back to what you said at the beginning of our talk here about so many uh, mediocre managers or toxic managers that there seems to be this this gotcha mentality in so many places where they're just waiting for people to screw up and and people are paralyzed to do anything creative right because they think well i'm going to get stomped all over if i fail instead of creating a culture of uh, uh, where failure is acceptable and we help each other learn from our mistakes and move forward yeah, absolutely. You know, I do this podcast, How Leaders Lead with David Novak and, you know, interview all kinds of leaders and, you know, the, the best leaders, they don't, they, they look at failure as, as something that is, is a part of innovation. You know, it's, it's something that you, you just need to do. You know, uh, Shantanu Narayan from, from Adobe, he doesn't even like the word failure. He doesn't like to use it. He, it's, it's like you learn from the experiences. You know, it's, it's learning that you, you, you glean. Okay. And, you know, you can't have an innovative environment without, without taking, taking risks. You know, part of the problem with leadership is that people work so hard to become a leader. You know, you think about the, the where I think you have the biggest problems is in, you know, first line leadership. You know, you, you've worked your tail off to be a leader and now you've got, you know, 10 people reporting to you and boy, you got to show them how smart you are. OK. And you got to, you know, tell them what they need to do versus letting them know that you need them to get to where you want to go. And there's a big, big difference there. And, you know, one one law in leadership which I'm sure you know very well is you, if you have uh, no involvement, you have no commitment. And, you know, I think uh, leaders that, that really know what they're doing, they get people involved and, you know, they encourage people to take risks, smart risk. Okay. Right. And, 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 and that in turn leads to much more innovative environments. I, I think that is, that is spot on. And, and really um, whether, whether you're a, a consultant a leader, a coach, it seems to me that the magic doesn't come from telling people what to do. It doesn't come from giving people solutions. It comes from asking the right questions and allowing mm-hmm. them to blossom based on thinking, wow, yeah. wow, that's a really good question. And number two, how would I answer it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, a great maxim for leadership is that telling isn't selling. Okay. Okay. And you need to remember that the, the idea that you come up with yourself is infinitely superior than someone telling it to you. So if you can basically feed the beast, OK, you know, if you can basically, you know, ask the questions, you know, show people the, the same things that you're seeing, create shared experiences where everybody else comes up with the same conclusion. It, 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 you know, that's when you're that's when you're really on your way. You know, part of uh the, the leader's job is to, to define reality and, and, and really lay it out there for everybody and then say, is this what you're seeing too? Okay. And if you can develop a shared reality where everybody agrees with the reality that's out there and, you know, sees the, the world the same way in terms of what needs to happen for you to really take a business forward, then you're, then you're on your way. I'm a, I'm a big believer in shared experiences where you, you take people out with you, take your team out with you, see, see the customer experience the way how the customer sees it, see the frontline experience the way how the frontline sees it. That, those shared experiences go, oh, wow. I get it. Yeah, we all see this together. Yeah, we need to do this. Yeah, and and, and I think that's when things magic really starts to happen. Yeah, I, I think that's that's spot on. So, um, just as we as we wrap things up, uh, David, when you when you wrote "Take Charge of You," uh, I, I should acknowledge that it, you you co wrote it with Jason Goldsmith. Right. Um, how is it that you would come to write? a uh, a business book a coaching book with a golf pro yeah well he's not a golf pro he's a sports performance coach okay well there you go and and uh you know uh 
Uh, I actually worked with Jason. He became one of my best friends. We talked a lot about coaching. I saw how he coached others. Uh, you know, he coaches Justin Rose and Jason Day, he helped them become number one golfers in the world. And I said, you know, I'm really thinking about writing a book, but, you know, I've written books before. I want to write something that's different. And I think it'd be really interesting, given the fact that we have such a like mind on on coaching, that if we wrote a book on coaching and then we sat down and said, what can make this book really different? And we said, well, there's lots of coaching books out there, but there's nothing really significant on self-coaching, how you coach yourself. So let's give people the exercises and tools that we use uh, that will help uh, people uh, become really good self-coach. And I think what we're most proud of in this book, and you referred to it at the, the beginning, uh, is there's a number of different exercises and tools that you have to work your way through. This is a book you can read from beginning to end, and I, I think because there's good stories in it, you can enjoy it. But the way you're going to get the most out of the book is actually do the exercises. You know, sit down and write down your joy blockers and your joy builders and 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 figure out your SBT, your significantly uh, uh, your, your your single biggest thing. Those that's how you're going to really uh, get the most out of the book. And we have great exercises that I think will help people do that. Yeah, you know, David, I have to uh, admit, I actually started going through some of the exercises myself just while I was reading the book, and I realized after I got through it, I'm like. I, I need to sit down and, you know, dedicate a good half day or so to, to taking this, not a test, but just taking these exercises and really bringing them to life because there's a lot I could actually use. Yeah, well, me too. You know, I still do my three by five card. I still do. I still try to go through a lot of these drills because, you know, it's, it's like, it's a never ending process. I mean, you as a leader, it's a never ending process. It's never done. The job is never done you know, for your business or, or for yourself. And if you can get some tools that help you, uh, you know, keep your process going, take your game to the next level, uh, then you're, then, then you're really going to, going to make a difference. And, and that's what Jason and I really, uh, try to do in this book. Uh, I'm pleased to say that it's off to a really great start. A lot of companies have uh, bought the book for their people. Um, and, uh, you know, we didn't know this when we wrote the book, but, you know, with the pandemic and the great resignation, the take charge of you is a great title. OK. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's always important for book sales. <laughs> it is I just it's it's perfect timing. And well, like we like to say here, it is uh, one of these timeless classics that I think people yeah. can continue to uh, to engage with. The book is Take Charge of You, How Self-Coaching Can Transform Your Life and Career by David Novak and Jason Goldsmith. David, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and so generous with your stories. Well, thank you, Scott. It's, uh, it's a labor of love to be able to talk about leadership and to be able to do it with you. And thank you for everything you're doing to, to, to help others learn from other people. To know yourself is to find your purpose, the North Star of your leadership development. When you stop running from yourself and ask critical questions, you'll truly be able to take charge of you. Thank you for joining us and for being an advocate for timeless and principled leadership whenever and wherever you find it. I'm Scott Monty. Until next time, may you dream more, learn more, do more, and become more. For you, our leader.